Hi, this is Jim Janesey. We're now on to chapter 24 of The Story of Art by Ernst Gombrich. In this chapter, we're going to take a look at the break in tradition, that is, the break in architecture and art following the Baroque era. I'm doing a little something different in this case. I've outlined for you here themes. There are seven themes altogether of the material in this chapter. And I'm going to take them in exactly this sequence, which is pretty much the sequence that Gombrich describes them. So I've put this theme at the top of the paintings and the illustrations that follow. First of all, new directions in architecture. After the Baroque era, some people, when they commissioned buildings, decided that they pretty much had the right to choose the style of building they wanted. In this case, the person who commissioned this building wanted to see something of a Gothic style to it. So we see here these crenellations. In Gothic times, archers defending a building would stand in these locations to shoot arrows at people who might be attacking, and then they would duck behind one of these crenellations for cover. These are just decorations on the house. Also, you can notice the pointed windows here, and various other kind of decorations that you might recognize from Gothic structures. This tracery on the windows here. As Gombrich points out, people began to think that they might just choose the style of their home the same way they would choose whatever wallpaper they would like to decorate the inside. Another interesting phenomenon occurred about this time. It was discovered that certain elements of architecture that Palladio had documented in the Renaissance and were thought to be key elements of Greek and Roman architecture turned out to have been based on some rather meager observations of buildings that weren't really representative of Greek and Roman architecture. When more original Greek structures were discovered and documented, a purified form, sort of a let's get back to the way the Greeks really did it form of architecture that was much simpler came to be in style. And you'll notice here these columns are Doric columns, it's rather simple columns, and the whole lines here are rather clean. Notice also that in this design, this area here at the top, this frieze area, where we have metabes and triglyphs in this area under the roof. This is more true to form with a Greek temple, and since the original Greek designs were becoming better known, some architects adapted them, and this is called neoclassicism. Thomas Jefferson also used some of these same concepts in that same era in designing his own house, and you can notice here, rather simple sort of a style to it, the Greek temple form here, also this area under the roof, triglyphs and an area for metabes in here, and these rather simple columns. Another example of neoclassicism. Now historical painting we took a look at in chapter 23. This is a very good example of it as we approach the year 1800. John Copley created a painting as accurately as he could of a key event in English history where for the first time the king was denied by an action of parliament. It was a clear indication that the divine right of kings actually had some limits. We're going to see later on, of course, that this divine right of kings is challenged in a very direct way with the French Revolution, which also has a very great impact on art and style. The French Revolution brought to a head the conflict between the Age of Reason and the Age of Enlightenment and various ideas about the rights of man, and the whole idea of the king ruling by divine right, that God had put him in charge and therefore we must obey. One of the impacts on art was that the revolutionaries of that era thought of themselves actually as reborn Greeks and Romans, that by doing away with the king and traditions that had grown up around the royalty, they were returning to a purer form of human existence that they theorized existed in Greek and Roman times. Now that's kind of a glossing over of things as far as they did exist in ancient Greece and Rome, but by adopting this philosophy, artists of that era began to adopt the same types of practices that ancient artists would use to depict the human body. When David was asked to paint a picture of the just assassinated revolutionary leader Marat, this is the painting that he created, and he idealized the body to make it very evident that Marat was a martyr to the cause, and his body is here depicted in a way similar to the way an ancient Greek statue might have been created, showing the muscles and the body in a rather beautified form, even though it's actually a corpse. In a way, you might think this has some reminiscences of the 
art of Karachi and Poussin, where the body, even of the dead Christ, is idealized in a similar way. The effect was very dramatic. This type of painting tended to raise the emotions and galvanize people involved in the revolution. Tradition rejected. In the early 1800s, certain artists began to really question whether the traditional art and the insistence on depicting mythological scenes or religious scenes as the only legitimate subjects for real art. That notion was challenged, and here we have Francisco Goya. In this painting, he's done a number of interesting things, simply painting two young women with their, perhaps their uh, chaperones or escorts in the background, putting this rail between the subject and the viewer, kind of a bold innovation. It sort of sets off space you can recognize with positional perspective in a very dramatic way. He's also done interesting things here with the background, where these figures look rather sinister in the background. In fact, especially so being cloaked like this, but just dark, dark in the background to set this forward scene off. This was different, significantly different than a picture would have been composed some years earlier. Is this really tradition rejected? This is a portrait. Goya was the court painter to the court of Spain. Interesting what he's done here, though. In order to make this not especially handsome man pleased with this painting, he's insisted on painting him in all this very colorful regalia. So here we have the king of Spain. Now, this is going to be a very dignified figure. But because all of the clothing here dazzles in its color and its splendor, Goya has gotten away with painting the actual picture of the king in a rather realistic way. In fact, he isn't very flattering. Maybe the king looked pretty much like this, but in earlier times his features might have been softened, or especially the way his lip is formed there, that's pretty much up to the choice of the portrait artist. But Goya has painted him in a way that seems to bring out a character that's well, not exactly the most flattering way of picturing a king. And Goya was able to get away with this because of his juxtaposition of all this grandeur. It's hard to argue about that. It certainly makes him look grand. And when somebody sees this painting, they can certainly admire, my, what a wonderful painting, and be somewhat believable about that, even though Goya is really sort of working at odds here to the king's interest in being painted in the most flattering sort of a way. But in this example of a different engraving process, you'll notice aquatint here was a mechanism by which the metal plate that was going to be used for an etching was covered with a resin sort of a blocking and then splattered with some water so that the little droplets would dissolve the resin and the metal plate could be etched in those locations. This had the effect of being able to make not just lines but patterns of tiny little dots so that a shading could be introduced into this engraved printing plate. In any case, the subject matter here definitely is non-traditional. It became possible for artists at this time to start innovating in terms of the subject matter they chose. Whether or not they intended this to be accepted as great art, they apparently felt the ability to experiment with the subject matter and it's not really known what Goya had in mind in picturing this giant, maybe some sort of a tale or a fable or something, but in any case, it was a very non-traditional type of subject matter. 